Hello, my name is Robert Paul Wolfe, and this is the ninth in a series of lectures on ideological critique. Last week, you will recall, I welcomed my old student, Derek Parfit, to my small class of imaginary students who helped me to overcome the impersonality of a camcorder. This week, I would like to welcome another young man who was not actually my student, but whom I know quite well. Becca Zizwait in Demande is a South African who was born in a shack settlement in the northern Transvaal. Somehow, he managed to do well enough in his elementary and secondary schooling to earn admission to the University of Durban Westville. There, he received a bursary from a scholarship organization that I ran called University Scholarships for South African Students an organization which I ran for 25 years from 1990 until last year, 2015. Becky, as he's called, succeeded in earning a bachelor's degree and an honors fourth year at U University of Durban Westville. Then he came on a USIA fellowship to the United States where he took a master's degree at my home university, the University of Massachusetts. And then he went on to the University of Wisconsin at Madison where he earned a PhD. And he is now teaching at the University of Texas in San Antonio. He is perhaps the most successful of the 1,600 students to whom I was able to give bursaries over a 25-year period. Becky, if you will join the other students, I'll get started. You'll recall that last week when I introduced you to Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s book, The Signifying Monkey, I talked about the figure in Yoruba religion, Ishu Elegbara, the two-faced character, a little man with one leg shorter than the other, with two mouths who speaks both to the gods and to people and interprets what the gods say to people and what people say to the gods. He is, as Gates says, in Yoruba tradition and religion, self-consciously the literary critic, functioning as the interpreter of texts. There's a second character in Yoruba culture, not in the religion but in the folk culture, who is also a central figure in what became African-American culture, and that is the figure of the monkey. In the tales, which are so common in Western, West African folklore, the tales of the monkey, the lion, and the elephant. If you don't know what these tales are, let me just spend a few minutes tell you, telling you about them. These are folk tales in which there are these three characters. The monkey is the trickster, the small, weak, clever, mischievous individual who plays verbal tricks on those around him. He's very weak, but he's very clever, and he uses his, his intelligence to trick others around him into doing what he wants them to do. The second character is the lion. Big, ferocious, vain, a braggart, clueless. He is unself-aware and therefore a perfect target for the monkey's trickster signifying on him. The third character is the elephant. Large, calm, confident. He is the real king of the jungle, not the lion who thinks of himself as the king of the jungle, but isn't really the king. Let me tell you a typical folk tale. There is one in The Signifying Monkey, but I can't read it to you because it's too obscene. All of these tales seem to be totally obscene, but very delightful nonetheless. In a typical tale of the lion, the monkey, and the elephant. The monkey is sitting up in the tree and he sees the lion come by on the ground beneath. He calls out to the lion and he tells him that the elephant has been saying terrible things about the lion's mother, his mama. Well, the lion gets very upset and off he goes to, to attack the elephant and stop him from saying these terrible things about his mama. You can imagine what happens. The elephant, who is quietly eating branches and twigs and leaves from the trees, sees the lion coming and pays no attention to him because he knows that there's nothing the lion could do to him. The lion roars and attacks the elephant, and the elephant knocks him silly, kicks the bejesus out of him, and sends him back limping into the forest, where the monkey sitting on the tree above jumps up and down delightedly and continues to tease and torment the lion. 
Well, typically what happens is that the monkey gets so pleased with himself in his hopping up and down that his foot slips and he falls to the ground. Immediately the lion jumps on him. And now the monkey is very contrite, pleads for his life, apologizes, and says that he only did this because he knew that the elephant was saying such terrible things about the lion and his, and his mother and his whole family. Whereupon the lion tricked once more, goes off to confront the elephant, again gets the bejesus kicked out of him, and comes limping back, and the monkey hops up and down in the tree and takes his revenge on the lion. This, this is the typical folk tale in the West African culture that Gates is drawing on. We might ask the, the obvious question, why are there always three characters in these folk tales? I don't know whether you've noticed that. For example, in America, where these tales migrated and were brought by the slaves, the lion, the monkey, and the elephant turned into Br'er Fox, Br'er Rabbit, and Br'er Bear. Same trio of characters with the same characteristics. Br'er Rabbit is the trickster, Br'er Fox is the vain braggart, and Br'er Bear is the calm, large, powerful, unmoved character who can knock the fox silly any time he wants to. Why always three characters? The reason is actually rather a profound one, and I want to take just a minute to explain it to you because it's key to everything else that we'll be talking about today. The central trope in literature is irony, based upon the distinction between appearance and reality. And in order for ironic communication to be constructed, one needs three characters, not two. Let me explain. In the typical ironic communication, there are three individuals. The first individual is the speaker who says something. The second individual is the apparent audience. The audience that thinks of itself as the real audience but isn't the real audience. The third character is the real audience. Now what the speaker says has a double meaning. So the speaker says something with a double meaning. The first audience hears the superficial meaning, the apparent meaning, and mistakenly thinks that it is the real meaning and that it is the real audience for that real meaning. It misunderstands what the speaker has said, therefore. The second audience understands both the superficial meaning and the deeper meaning. It understands that it is the audience for the deeper meaning, and it also knows that there is a superficial audience, an apparent audience, that has mistakenly taken the superficial meaning for the real meaning. So that the ironic utterance is, in a manner of speaking, a private joke between the speaker and the real audience at the expense of the apparent audience. Now that's all rather abstract, so let me give you a concrete example. This is one I made up 40 years ago when I was writing a philosophy textbook. I used it to explain Platonic Socratic irony in the textbook, and after one edition the publishers decided that it was not quite appropriate for a philosophy textbook, so they had me think up a new example. But this is the original example I thought up. There is a young woman who comes from a very religious, very proper family. She has a boyfriend, and unbeknownst to her mother, she is having a, vi a wild affair with that boyfriend. One evening, the boyfriend shows up to take the young woman out on a date, and the mother is waiting. She says, where are you going? The young man says, we're going to a church social. And the mother says, be back by 10 o'clock sharp, no later. And as they're walking out the door, she says to her daughter, now you be a good girl. Yes, Mama, says the daughter, and off the couple go, ostensibly to go to a church social, but actually to go to the young man's apartment, where they make passionate love for a while. Just before 10 o'clock, the young man brings the young woman home, and sure enough, the mother is waiting. When they come in, the mother says to the young girl, were you a good girl? And the young man answers for her. He says, apparently, to the mother, oh yes, she was a good girl. She was good. She was very good. Well, what the mother hears, 
is that the young woman was proper and behaved herself and there was no hanky-panky. What the young woman hears is that she was hot in bed. The statement, she was good, she was very good, is an ironic utterance, ostensibly directed toward the mother, but actually directed toward the daughter. It is a private joke between the young man and the young woman at the expense of the mother. That is the basic structure of ironic communication. And as we'll see, it turns up in a large variety of forms in African American culture. Because now what Gates does is to make the transition to the new world. Ishu Elegbera reappears in voodoo religion in the Caribbean as Papa Legba or as Legba, and he plays an important role in voodoo religion. The trickster monkey reappears in the form of what is called signifying, hence the title of Gates's book. What is signifying? Well, it is the self-aware playing with language that Gates identifies as a form of oral literary criticism and it manifests itself in the popular culture of African Americans in a variety of language games, all of which are gathered under the general heading of signifying. Remember what it is that Gates is saying. He's not just saying that African Americans do these things, play these games, and we, the literary critics, can understand what they are doing. He is saying something much more important. He is arguing that the African Americans themselves are self-consciously aware that they are engaged in language games and that these language games have a certain form or structure and they are commenting upon their own language games as they proceed. What are some of these language games? Well, one of the best known is something called Playing the Dozens. I don't know whether any of you has ever heard of Playing the Dozens. The Dozens is a kind of over-the-top insult game, a competition that takes place, a verbal competition between two people. One insults, I can't actually read you the examples that Gates gives because they are so obscene. You can imagine that what they are, every one of them has the word MF in it over and over and over again. But the structure is quite simple. One of the two characters insults the other. He doesn't do this meanly or viciously. He does this as a kind of game. He thinks up a clever insult, typically having something to do with your mama or your grandmama or your aunt or your sister. This is done, by the way, in the presence of an audience, other people sitting around enjoying this game. Then the second character comes back spontaneously on the spot with, a, with an insult which is even more outrageous than the first one. The first one then tries to top that with an even more extreme insult and back and forth they go thinking up more and more elaborate and imaginative insults. All of these done spontaneously on the spot building on the insults that the opponent has offered until finally one of them comes up with an insult so over the top, so wild, so imaginative, that the other simply can't top it, and then he's defeated. And everybody collapses in laughter and agrees that the one who went last with the to over the top insult is the winner. That's playing the dozens. And it's a verbal, it's a very complicated verbal game, which takes a lot of skill and a lot of spontaneous inventiveness and is done in all sorts of ways in the black community. A second example is what we now call rapping. Again, something that is spontaneous, not planned. You make it up as you go along. And you have to have tremendous verbal skill in order to rap. And this, again, is an example of the sort of thing that is done in the black community. A third example is something called loud talking. This was one I had never heard of until I read Gates's book. Let me read you the example that Gates gives of loud talking. It's kind of fun. Loud talking goes like this.
Gates says, this mode of signifying is commonly practiced by Afro-American adults. It is functionally equivalent to one of its embedded tropes, often called louding or loud talking, which as we might expect, connotes exactly the opposite of that which it denotes. One successfully loud talks by speaking to a second person, remarks in fact directed to a third person. You see the same ironic structure at a level just audible to the third person. A sign of the success of this practice is an indignant, what, from the third person, to which the speaker responds, I wasn't talking to you. Of course, the speaker was, yet simultaneously was not. He gives an example here. A woman who says, I saw a woman the other day in a pair of stretch pants. She must have weighed 300 pounds. If you knew how she looked, she would burn those things. If a member of the speaker's audience is overweight and frequently wears stretch pants, then this message could well be intended for her. If she protests, the speaker is free to maintain that she was speaking about someone else and to ask why her audience is so paranoid. Alternatively, the speaker can say, if the shoe fits, Here's another example, which is rather nice. The first one introduces this exchange by explaining that after I had my little boy, I swore I was not having any more babies. I thought four kids was a nice sized family, but it didn't turn out that way. I was a little bit disgusted and didn't tell anybody when I discovered I was pregnant. My sister came over one day and I had started to show by that time. Rochelle said, Girl, you sure do need to join the Metric Alpha Lunch Bunch. Grace, the one who's now pregnant, says noncommittally, Yes, I guess I am putting on a little weight. Rochelle, now look here, girl, we both standing here soaking wet, and you still trying to tell me it ain't raining. There's a perfect example of this kind of friendly signifying in this case. <laughs> signifying takes place even in music, in a jam session, when musicians are, are improvising, one of them will lay out a theme and a second one will improvise on it and a third will improvise on the improvisation of the first and they are in that sense signifying on one another. Now, you might wonder, I call it signifying, Gates calls it signifying, do they think of it as signifying? Well, go to YouTube and punch in Count Basie signifying. Up will come a YouTube recording of Count Basie playing a famous jazz tune called by Count Basie signifying. The answer is quite simple. They knew exactly what they were doing. Exactly. Now, this tremendous linguistic facility is not something you're born with. It's not like having naturally curly hair. It's a skill that has to be learned. And it, has, and it can be taught by adults to children. Uh, let me read you a long quote from a scholar named Claudia Mitchell Kernan, who is quoted by Gates in his book. This quotation is actually included in Gates's book. Mitchell Kernan had written a book called Language Behavior in a Black Urban Community. And although this is a long passage, I'm going to read the whole thing because I want you to listen carefully and get an understanding of what, of what happens in the African American community about language. Mitchell Kernan writes the following. At the age of seven or eight, I encountered what I believe was a version of the tale of the signifying monkey. In this story, a monkey reports to a lion that an elephant has been maligning the lion and his family. This is a very proper rendering by Mitchell Kernan of an obscene story. This stirs the lion into attempting to impose sanctions against the elephant. I love this way of describing these monkey-elephant-lion stories. A battle ensues in which the element elephant is victor and the lion returns extremely chafed at the monkey. In this instance, the recounting of this story is a case of signifying for directive purposes. Mitchell Kernan has been talking about different categories of signifying. 
I was sitting, sitting on the stoop of a neighbor who was telling me about his adventures as a big game hunter in Africa, a favorite tall tale topic, unrecognized by me as a tall tale at the time. A neighboring woman called to me from her porch and asked me to go to the store for her. I refused, saying that my mother had told me not to, a lie which Mr. Waters recognized and asked me about. Rather than simply saying I wanted to listen to his stories, I replied that I refused to go because I hated the woman. Being pressured for a reason for my dislike and sensing Mr. Waters' disapproval, I encountered with another lie. I hate her because she say you were lazy, attempting, I suppose, to regain his favor by arousing ire towards someone else. You see the complex, ironic structure of all of this. Although I had heard someone say that he was lazy, it had not been this woman. He explained to me that he was not lazy and that he didn't work because he had been laid off from his job and couldn't find work elsewhere. And if the that if the lady had said what I reported, she had done not done so out of meanness, but because she didn't understand. Guilt-ridden, says Mitchell Kernan, I went to fetch the can of milk. Upon returning, the tale of the signifying monkey was told to me, a censored prose version in which the monkey is rather brutally beaten by the lion after having suffered a similar fate in the hands of the elephant. I liked the story very much and righteously approved of its ending, not realizing at the time that he was signifying at me. Mr. Water reacted to me to my response with a great deal of amusement. It was several days later, in the context of retelling the tale to another child, that I understood its timely telling. My apology and admission of lying were met by affectionate humor, and I was told that I was finally getting to an age where I could, quote, hold a conversation i.e. understand and appreciate implications. In short, this man, Mr. Waters, in a very gentle and affectionate way, had undertaken to teach the young eight-year-old Mitchell Kernan how to hold a conversation. He had attempted to introduce her to the subtleties of language that would enable her to understand communications between adult African Americans and therefore would make it possible for her to join and become part of the adult community when she grew old enough. Does this sort of thing ever actually happen or is it just a made-up story by Mitchell Kernan? Well, it so happens that I know the answer to that question. It does happen. How do I know that? Because it happened to me. Let me tell you what happened. In 1992, I was invited to join the Afro-American Studies Department at the University of Massachusetts. The chair, Esther Terry, wanted me to join the department so that I could help folks there in creating a revolutionary PhD program. Only the second such PhD program to come into existence in the entire world. Well, I jumped at the opportunity and my goods were transferred over from Bartlett Hall on one side of the campus to New Africa House on the other side of the campus and I settled into my new office. The office, by the way, I later found out, had been occupied about 10 or 15 years earlier by James Baldwin. I was walking in the footsteps of giants. At any rate, as soon as the new semester started, Esther called a department meeting, and we all trooped down to a big classroom at the end of the hall on the third floor of New Africa House, where we held department meetings, since we didn't have a real department meeting room. One of the members of the department was Nelson Stevens, a black artist, painter, who had been part of the black arts movement some years earlier. Nelson lived in the city of Springfield, which is 20 miles south of the campus. And when he came to campus, he would park at one of the metered parking spots right in front of New Africa House. Now, I don't want to make claims I can't prove, but it did seem that the campus police checked those meters more often than they checked meters elsewhere on the campus. At any rate, Nelson was worried that he would get a ticket. So he kept getting up and walking over to the window and looking down to see whether the police were coming so he could run downstairs and put another couple of quarters in the meter. After a while, his colleagues started teasing him about this. And then they started telling each other some stories about experiences they'd had with the campus police. 
Mike Felwell told a story about the time that he was giving a young white student, female student, a ride home to her dormitory and was stopped by a campus policeman who saw a young white woman in a car with a black man and thought there might be a problem here. Esther Terry told the story of a time that she was called to the administration building during a racial crisis on campus at a time when she was the associate provost of the university, a very high position. And the guard at the door to the administration building wouldn't let her in until one of Esther's assistants, a white man, came along and vouched for her. And others told other stories. Well, as I listened to these stories, I began to think how strikingly different their experience of the campus was from mine. When I joined the department in 1992, I had already been a senior professor on the campus for 21 years. And yet in those 21 years, I had not so much as spoken to a campus policeman. I certainly didn't know their names. I didn't know which were the ones that you could get along with and which were the problematic ones that you needed to stay away from. And so I thought to myself, well, this is a real lesson in the fact that I and my new colleagues, even though we have both been on this campus for many years, are really living in different worlds. And then another thought occurred to me. My new colleagues were all inveterate storytellers. They loved to tell stories. They had been each other's colleagues for 20 years and more. Surely they had all told each other these stories a thousand times. Why on earth were they telling each other these stories again? And then the shades dropped from my eyes and I realized what was really going on. My new colleagues had a problem. It was a kind of a tricky problem. I was the first new member of the department in many years and I was white, still am. I was furthermore the oldest member of the department. I was actually two years older than the person who had been the oldest member of the department until I joined the department. But I was clueless. I knew less about Afro-American studies than an undergraduate majoring in the department. And I knew virtually nothing about what it was like to be black on the UMass campus or anywhere else in America for that matter. So their problem was that they couldn't have a conversation with me unless I began to understand what it was like to be black on this campus and what it meant to be a member of the Afro-American Studies Department. But courtesy, politeness, a sense of appropriateness made it impossible for them to just sit me down and tell me, which they could have done if I had been a young assistant professor, but which they couldn't appropriately do since I was a senior professor and older than they were. So quite spontaneously, using the occasion of Nelson Stevens' anxiety about getting a parking ticket, they collectively hit upon the technique of telling each other these stories, which they had heard a thousand times, in my presence, so that they were telling me the stories without seeming to tell them to me. And by doing so, they were educating me until it would be possible for me to have a conversation with them. When I realized this, I was profoundly touched because it seemed to me one of the most gracious and thoughtful and intelligent and skillful pieces of verbal behavior I had ever encountered. Let me say, by the way, I, have, I was a member during my long 50-year career of five departments, the Harvard Philosophy Department, the Philosophy Department of the University of Chicago, the Columbia Philosophy Department, the Philosophy Department of the University of Massachusetts, and the Afro-American Studies Department. My colleagues in those philosophy departments were very smart. Some of them were very brilliant. People like Willard Van Orman Quine and Ernest Nagel and others. But I can say with absolute certainty that there wasn't a single member of any one of those departments who could have done what my colleagues in Afro-American studies did. They would not even have realized the necessity of it, and they would not have hit upon so gracious and imaginative a solution to an otherwise difficult social, intellectual, and cultural problem. And they did it all without consultation, without planning. They just 
spontaneously did it because they, each one of them knew they had a problem and they solved it in this way. It was an extraordinary moment and it, in effect, it prepared me for reading Gates's book. When I read Gates's book some years later, not too many years later, I recognized in his descriptions this kind of verbal skill and self-consciousness in the use of verbal skills that I had encountered almost the first day that I entered the department. Now, what I've been talking about thus far is the first half of Gates's book. The second half consists of detailed analyses of three important African-American novels, out of which Gates elaborates a literary theory of African-American literature. I can't really talk about them because I can't assume that you've read all those novels. The three novels are Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, Ishmael Reed's Mumbo Jumbo, and Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Of those three, I imagine that the one that is best known to people watching this video is Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Not only has it received wide attention, but it was made into a very popular movie with uh, Oprah Winfrey playing the main character, Seeley. So my guess is that a number of you have some acquaintance with The Color Purple, but not with the others. What Gates claims, speaking very generally about these novels, is that they, they exhibit a self-conscious, deliberate application of the literary critical concept of signifying to the African-American literary tradition. Not just that a literary critic can see that each of them is signifying on the n novelists who came before, but that the novelists themselves think of themselves as signifying on the novelists who came before. That they are doing self-consciously what literary critics claim novelists do when they write their literary criticism. Now this is not the way that critics usually read novels by black authors. They tend not to impute to black authors, and particularly to black female authors, a level of self-awareness that they are prepared to impute to great white novelists. Let me give you just one brief conclusion, uh, one brief example. This is my own example, not Gates's, and it has to do with the color purple. In order to explain this, I need to say just a little bit about what The Color Purple is. For those of you who haven't read it and haven't encountered the novel, it is a novel about a character, Seely, a young southern black woman who at the beginning of the novel is 14 years old and who during the course of the novel grows up, as it were, to maturity. She's from a rural uh, environment and she is not ed much educated at all. The novel consists entirely of letters. It is what is called an epistolary novel. Now that's an interesting choice by Walker and it's a very important choice. The epistolary novel is always said by literary critics to be the first form of the English novel, Samuel Richardson being the famous exemplar of the epistolary novel. Richardson in the 18th century wrote three monstrously long epistolary novels consisting entirely of letters between different characters. Uh, and uh, Pamela, Clarissa, and Sir Charles Grandison are the three novels. I happen to know this because my first wife wrote her doctoral dissertation on Samuel Richardson's novels. And as a good husband, I sat down and read the bloody things, long as they were. I mean, they go for several volumes. The novel begins with a single line of direct discourse. Everything else is letters. I'll read you that single line of direct discourse. It's the first line of the novel, and it's in italics, and it reads like this. You better not never tell nobody but God, it'd kill your mammy. This, we are given to understand, is spoken by Celie's stepfather, and what he's talking about is that he has been raping her ever since she reached puberty. And he says, you better not never tell nobody but God, it would kill your mammy. The next words are, dear God. 
and Celie starts writing a series of letters to God. She writes a long series of letters to God in which she tells God and us what is happening in her life. She has a sister, Nettie, who has gone north, and she hasn't heard from Nettie. It turns out that Nettie has been writing to her, but Celie's husband, she gets married, has been intercepting the letters and keeping them instead of giving them to Celie. Midway through the novel, Celie gets hold of these not letters, and we now read all of the letters from Nettie. Nettie has gone north, she has met a missionary couple, and has gone with that missionary couple to Africa where they're doing good works among the natives, and Nettie is writing back about her experiences. When Celie gets Nettie's letters, she starts writing to Nettie, and now we have some letters back and forth between Celie and Nettie until the end of the novel. Now, there are a number of remarkable things about these letters. One in particular has received commentary in the secondary literature. I actually went off and read the secondary literature, which is not typical for me, but I did. A number of critics commented disapprovingly about the fact that although Seeley's letters are lively and vivacious and fascinating, Nettie's letters are stilted and boring and flat. And they, they criticize Walker for failing to write interesting letters for Net Nettie, like the interesting letters she wrote for Seeley. Now, there are a couple of things to think about. Seeley and Nettie are sisters. They grew up in the same family. They have the same amount of education, for better or for worse. Seeley writes semi-literate but lively letters. Nettie writes grammatically, exactly, correctly, precise, boring, stilted letters. Why is this? How could it be that two sisters write so differently? Furthermore, if Alice Walker could write interesting letters for Seeley, she could have written interesting letters for Nettie. Clearly, it was an authorial choice on her part to make Nettie's letters boring and Seeley's letters interesting. It may have been the wrong choice. I happen to think it was the right choice, but it was a choice. It was done self-consciously. You really have to be dead from the neck up to imagine that an author who could write Seeley's letters couldn't have written interesting letters for Nettie had she chosen to do so. What's going on? Well, what's going on is actually rather fascinating, and nobody, including Gates, seems to notice it. What's going on is this. Nettie follows what was the stereotypically proper path. She goes north to where the Harlem Renaissance was. She meets a couple. The woman has actually gone to Spelman Institute, what later became Spelman College, the greatest of the black, historically black women's colleges. The young man has met the great W.E.B. Du Bois. The two of them go off to do good missionary works in Africa. Nettie has done, has followed the path which is supposedly the right path, what we would today call the politically correct path for a young black woman. Celie has stayed home. She stayed where she was. She has grown, she has developed herself into a fully realized and fully accomplished lesbian woman. She has a relationship with a woman named Shug whom she writes about a good deal. At the end of the novel, you would think if you were completely taken up by the ideology of the Harlem Renaissance, that Nettie would send for Seeley, bring her north to where there is culture and life and freedom. In fact, what happens is that Seeley sends for Nettie, brings Nettie back home, incorporates Nettie into the lively and fully emotionally realized world that Celie has created for herself, and in this way signifies on and reverses the standard Harlem Renaissance self-celebratory story. It's an extraordinary accomplishment by Alice Walker, clearly self-conscious and deliberate, it's obvious that she has chosen the epistolary novel for its literary effect and for its connection to the whole history of English literature. And the critics who write about the, this color purple, even though they may like the novel, 
don't notice this because Alice Walker is black and she's a woman. Well, Gates' conclusion. There is a self-conscious theory of literary criticism in the popular oral culture of African Americans, a theory as sophisticated as that of the high priests of literary criticism, and it is taken up into the written African American literary tradition. The central trope of this tradition is signifying, and the embodiment of this tradition is the signifying monkey. What Gates has done here in developing a theory of the signifying monkey and a theory of African American literary criticism is to signify on Harold Bloom, Paul DeMond, Jacques Derrida, Jeffrey Hartman, and the rest of the high priests of lit crit. What he is saying is not simply that black people do what white people do. They have been doing it for hundreds of years and it's not just a handful of super smart university professors who do it. It's men standing on a street corner playing the dozens who do it. It's women in a barber shop who do it. It's rappers who do it. It is jazz musicians who do it. They all do it. It's my colleagues at, in Afro-American studies who did it when they educated me so that I could hold a conversation. Now, that's what I have to say about the signifying monkey, but there's still one question I haven't answered. Who is the signifying monkey? Well, the answer is this. In the late 1960s, a young man came to Yale to begin his academic studies. He was a little man with one leg shorter than the other because of a childhood accident. He was very, very smart. He was short, he was skinny, and he was black. And he encountered literary criticism in its high glory at Yale. Who was he? He was Ishu Elegbara. He was the signifying monkey. What was his name? His name was Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Gates is the signifying monkey. Next week, Jane Austen. <laughs>